Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you here in uh, the late part of July. Summer is passing by, as you've already heard. It's hard to believe. And uh, thank God for the wonderful time of worship we've enjoyed together. I'm thankful for everyone that uh, contributes in a positive way to our worship experience. Joel leads a great team of band and vocalists and the tech team, audio and video. We thank God for each one of them giving of their time and energy to enable us to have a worship service like this. And it's been great to sense his presence here in the middle of the summer. And here we are in week number three of a five-part series called The End Commandments. Uh, the N stands for not. We're talking about these not commandments, these end commandments. And um, these are things that we as Christians are told not to do. And what's interesting about it is the knots that we're focusing on are not the knots that you might expect us to focus on, uh, because the knots that you think we might focus on would be things that we get out of the Bible, like do not steal, do not lie, do not commit adultery. Those are out of the Ten Commandments. That's out of Exodus. That's uh, the Old Testament. And we, we want to adhere to those things. But you know, the, the knots that we're focused on are coming straight from the lips of Jesus, uh, a different set of knots, and uh, they're things that, that sound difficult, if not impossible, to obey. And I want you to think about that. We've already talked about uh, fear not in week number one, and uh, last night, or last week, we talked about sin not. G you know, we were told to go and sin no more. That's what was told to, by Jesus to the woman at the well, and some people would say, well, I don't see how that's possible. I sin in word, thought, and deed every day, and yet Jesus Christ himself said, go and sin no more. We don't believe Jesus would tell us something that's absolutely impossible to do. He was calling us to a higher standard and to a better way of living. And so uh, as we continue on, if you missed out in one of those first couple of weeks, I would encourage you to go online, uh, go to thepoint.com where you can watch or listen online. And today uh, we're going to focus on our third knot. And it, it may seem unrealistic to command some of these things on the surface uh, some of these things that we're talking about, but Jesus himself said, hey, if you love me, you'll obey me, and we need to know what he said. Otherwise, how do we obey? And so when Jesus uh, started out in his earthly ministry, there's a message that he gave over in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's the greatest message that was ever preached. It is called the Sermon on the Mount. That's the way we refer to it. And uh, in that message, he made a powerful statement, and it is a statement that you have heard, no doubt, probably read it, you've heard it before, but you probably haven't obeyed it at least 100% of the time. And uh, that's where we're going to begin. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Here's what Jesus said. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Now, I should just open the altar and we, we could be done. <laughs> You know, the altars are open, everybody come and pray. Um, worry is what happens when I drag tomorrow's troubles into today. That'd be a good definition for us to think in terms of worry. It's what happens when I drag tomorrow's trouble into today. Now, uh, I want to have a moment of confession as we get started and just be honest. How many of you have ever violated that direct command of Jesus, do not worry? Would you just raise your hand? Confession is good for the soul. I think it's unanimous. It ought to be because all of us have worried about something. Um, but we don't want to make excuses and cop out. We want to hear what Jesus said. We want to understand it, and we want to obey. And, um, you know, Jesus knew something uh, that all of us know, but most of us seem to forget, and that is the fact that worry is without value. It, it cannot add one hour to your life. We know that's the truth. Uh, in fact, worry can actually take years off of your life hours off your life, but it can take years off of your life. So why worry? I mean, worry doesn't accomplish anything that's positive. Uh, I mean, it accomplishes nothing, really. Worry is destructive. And so if it accomplishes nothing, and if it adds no value to your life, if it changes nothing in a positive way, then it makes sense for Jesus to tell us, do not worry. So the question for us this morning is, how are we going to obey that command? Because we've confessed that just about everybody in this place, everybody hearing this message would say, I've worried. So how do you not worry? Uh, that's the question for the morning. And so uh, Jesus offered his followers an alternative. 
Maybe it's called an antidote to worry. It's not going to cost you anything. I want to present it to you. I want you to think about it and consider how this could apply in your life. We're going to continue on Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. These are the words of Jesus when he said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. See, Jesus goes right to the heart of what worry is really all about. Um, you know, he tapped into the primary concerns of people in the first century because, see, worry is about later. Worry is not about now. We can do something about now. Worry is about later. Worry is about tomorrow. And so by tapping into their concerns, he talked about what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Those were the big three. Um, those are not really our primary concerns. I mean, today in our world and and, in the lives of most people in this room, uh, that's probably not your biggest concern. Most of us know what we're going to eat. You know what you're going to drink. You know what you're going to wear. I mean, people in the first century would be absolutely surprised, I think, to imagine that any of us would have anything to worry about. Because we have plenty of food, most of us, in our cabinets or in our pantry or in our refrigerator. We have plenty of clean water to drink. Most of us have closets full of clothes. A lot of them we don't even wear. So what do we worry about? What do you worry about? Uh, worry about the kids? Uh, worry about the tuition? Man, what's it going to cost by the time my kid gets to be old enough to go to college? Am I going to be able to afford it? Uh, we worry about the job. You know, it's hanging by a thread. We don't know if we're going to have one next week or maybe next year. Um, we worry about our health. Uh, we worry about aging. We actually still do worry a lot about appearance on a different level. We worry about diet on a different level. We worry a lot about lots and lots of different things. Things really have not changed all that much, even though we have plenty in the way of food and water and clothing. But Jesus plainly said, do not worry. See, all of our worries have to do with the future. Um, he continues in verse 25. He says, Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? I think in a roundabout way, Jesus is saying life is about far more than what you worry about. I mean, what you worry about is, is here, but life is here. It's about so much more than what you worry about. And so it, here's a good exercise. I, I would encourage you to sometime maybe today or this week, write down everything that you worry about. Just maybe take out a legal pad or a notepad or something, or maybe open up a Word document and, and at the top, what I worry about, dot, 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 and then fill up the page. Some of you could fill up pages. Now, some of you maybe wouldn't fill up quite as much, but whatever it is, here's what I worry about. And just begin to fill it in. Bring everything front and center in your life that you worry about. Just make a list, get it out there, and then look at that list and ask yourself this question, isn't my life bigger than these things that I worry about? My life, my legacy, my purpose, they're bigger than what I worry about. See, all of that is bigger than our worries because most of the stuff we worry about usually is very small, petty things, things that we can't change, and it's all about tomorrow. So when you worry, it's almost like we take what we worry about and we equate it with what we eat, drink, or wear, our job, our tuition, our paying the bills, whatever. But the point is there's far more to your life than those kinds of things. We would all agree with that. We all get it. Verse 26 he goes on, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Now, Jesus is obviously not arguing for irresponsibility. We know he wouldn't do that. It'd be inconsistent with other things. But he is saying that human beings have an advantage over all the rest of nature. Um, and here's the advantage. We can sow and we can reap. Uh, we can anticipate the future. We can prepare for the future. Uh, we can plan ahead and we can get ready for tomorrow. That's uh, an ability. That's what gives us, um, you know, the, the, as human beings, that's something that puts us above nature. But that's also what gives us the capacity to worry because we can anticipate, because we can plan ahead. 
See, compared to the birds of the air and the rest of nature that can't sow or reap, they have no concept of tomorrow. We can plan ahead and we can prepare. But the question we have to keep in mind that Jesus asks, aren't you more important than they are? Aren't you more important than the birds of the air or a couple of sparrows? Surely you are. So then he takes it right to the heart of the issue in verse 27. He says, so who of you by worrying can even add a single hour to his life? Who of you by worrying can even add a single hour to his life? Now time and health and life, that's all important. And yet by worrying, nobody here can add a single hour, not even a single hour to your life. Think about that. It's meaningless. It has no value. It's, it's destructive, not constructive. And so why do we do it? Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. I mean, they have no way to sow or reap or prepare for the future. Yet I tell you in verse 29, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? The big issue with worry is summed up in a single question. And that question is this, do I trust that God can and will take care of me? Do I trust that God can and will take care of me? That's the question. Um, if God's done all that he's done for nature, and if, if I'm more important to him than all of the grass and the flowers and the fields and the birds and all that stuff, then why can't I trust that he will take care of me? See, we were created in God's image and he has promised, he, folks, he has promised to care for us. And so my question is, can we trust that God will do what he promised? I mean, you know the answer. We all know the answer. Can we trust that God will do what he has promised? Uh, how big is God anyway? Is he big enough to do what he said? We would all say yes. And how important are you anyway? I mean, really, how important are you? Are you not important enough that Jesus Christ, God's son, came to die for your sins? That's pretty important if you ask me. So God's big enough, and you're important enough. So the question is, why do we worry? And then add to that how he takes care of everything else in all creation. Worry really is an issue of trust. How much confidence do I have in God? How much confidence do I have in God? And we talk around here about building bigger faith. We want to see everybody grow in their faith. I hope that at the end of this year that your faith then is bigger than your faith is today. I hope your faith is bigger today than it was last year at this time. And so as we build bigger faith, we have to learn to trust God more and more and more. And so the question, how much confidence do I have in God? And understanding that worry is when I reach out to tomorrow and I drag tomorrow's concerns into today. Our emotions get overloaded with what's going on today, and then we try to add tomorrow's troubles onto today. That's never a good thing. And Jesus is trying to tell us that. He's trying to tell you something. And maybe, maybe this is why God brought you here this morning, just to tell you this. I've got this. Whatever it is you're worrying about right now, whatever that concern or that burden or that, that thing is that you brought into this sanctuary this morning, whatever that thing that is consuming your time and your energy, your mind is wrapped around it all the time, 24-7 it seems, and, and, and maybe it's just that God brought you here to say that I have everything under control. Should we even have to be reminded? But we do, don't we? We need to be reminded that God has everything under control. We need to be reminded that we can trust him. We don't have to worry. We don't have to drag tomorrow's concerns into today because God will take care of not only our todays, but he will take care of our tomorrows and all the tomorrows of life. But when you merge today and tomorrow, all you're gonna do is worry and that won't change anything in any kind of positive way. 
Jesus continues on in verse 31. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. I mean, you don't want to be like a pagan, do you? I I don't want to be like the pagans, heathen people, wicked people, ungodly people. I don't want to be a pagan. Anybody want to be a pagan? Raise your hand. Nobody wants to be a pagan. No takers on that. That was just to see who's awake awake and paying attention there. Oh, yeah, raise your hand. I'm I'm awake. No, you're a pagan. (laughs) Just waiting on it. See, we have this God in heaven who loves us. And he has promised to take care of us. We're not pagans. We have a heavenly father that knows exactly what we need. What if? What if you were confident of that? That God really does know exactly what you need. Wouldn't it be great to audibly hear God say, you know, hey, Steve, I know what you're going through. I know how you feel. I know what you think. I know what's going on in your life. I know what they said. I know what they did. I know what you're worried about. I know about tomorrow. I know about all that stuff. I know where you are. I know what you're going through. Son, it's going to be all right. Wouldn't it be awesome to audibly hear God say, I've got this. It's all good. You're going to be all right. What if you could just be sure that God knew what you needed, that he knows the concerns of your heart? I think the Bible tells us plainly that he does know. That's what Jesus was telling the crowd that day. That's what he's telling you and me today. He knows what you need. So he offers us an alternative. When you go back there, you know, your father knows that you need them, all these things. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Your father knows. Verse 33, here's the alternative he gives us. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. See, worry is about chasing things you can never control anyway. We've all done it. Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom, and all these things are going to be taken care of. Now, if you're new or newer to the church, you may say, seek first his kingdom. What does that mean? Hey, let's be honest. Some of us have been sitting around here for a long time. I don't know. Seek first. I've said it. I've quoted it. Got it hanging on the wall at home. But I don't know what that's all about. Seek first his kingdom. We're to make the things of God a priority in our life over the things of the world. Make God's priorities the, the priority. God's kingdom is what he's up to in the world today. And so when you're tempted to borrow from tomorrow, look for a way to participate in what God is doing today, in the present, in the here and now. Instead of running after and seeking after all these things that you have no control over, Jesus says, hey, look around and find a way to participate with me today and then trust me with tomorrow. Now, I want you to think about the things you worry about the most. Because Jesus, I believe, would have us relabel all of those worries, and that might just be the thing you need to do. What are the things that you worry about in regard to tomorrow? Matthew chapter 6, if we were to take that verse and say, therefore do not worry about, and we just put a blank there, and you were to fill in the blank, what would you write in that space? Therefore do not worry about Um, the mortgage payment that's overdue, the kid's tuition that's coming up, the surgery that happens next week. Therefore, do not worry about aging or about job security or about this or that or the other thing, that relationship, the finances, you name it. See, whatever you tend to reach out and pull into today from tomorrow or whatever you reach out and pull into today from next week, or whatever you reach out from today and reach into next month or next year and pull into today, whatever that is, Jesus wants you to put a label on it, and it's a label that ought to be easy to remember but it is because it includes all these things. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Just label, relabel all that stuff. You can relabel it all, all that stuff you've been worrying about, and just call it tomorrow. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. 
next week, next month, next year, whatever it is that made your list. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. We worry about tomorrow. Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. Don't bring tomorrow into today. When we worry about tomorrow, we need to be reminded that our heavenly father says, we don't need to worry about tomorrow today. Verse 34, look what Jesus said. Do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Why do you want to go out and smuggle tomorrow's trouble into today? I mean, isn't there already enough trouble today? Don't you already have enough going on today? Why would you want to bring it all in? Why worry when you know your heavenly father is with you today and he'll be waiting for you tomorrow? Don't, don't go doing that. You may think, you know, that you're an exception to the rule and maybe you're sitting there in this service and you're making all these excuses and you're arguing with me in your mind and, and, and you may think that your worry's bigger than anything Jesus had in mind and, and nobody else around here gets it because you're the only one and nobody understands your concerns and, and because your stuff's different than everybody else, you get a pass on this. What if you believe that God knows what you need and that he will be there for your tomorrow? No excuses, no cop-outs. When he says, do not worry, put you know, tomorrow aside, it applies to all of us. What if you really believed and obeyed what Jesus said? What if you really believed what Jesus said about your future? How would that change things? And, and really... Why wouldn't you believe it? Oh, Steve, I wouldn't believe it because, you know, that Bible, it, it just sounds ridiculous. I'm not sure that'll work, this not worrying thing. I mean, my worry, it's really working well for me. I mean, it's coming through, and I don't think this do not worry. I, I, this is one, I'm going to set this one aside. Maybe the fear not, I might try that sin not, but this worry not, I just don't see going down that road. I'm not sure, I'm not sure God could come through. See, it all comes down to a matter of trust. If you choose not to do what Jesus is calling you to do, it's about a faith issue. It's about a trust issue. Because really what Jesus is saying, he says, place your faith and trust and confidence and hope in God. We, we talk about bigger faith. This is the way to do it. All of us get to choose where we're going to place our faith and trust. And you can place it in a lot of different places, but the primary two places really where you're going to place it is you're either going to place it in worry or in God. Those are your two options. I'm going to choose to place my faith and trust in worry, or I'm going to choose to place my faith and trust in God. Which one is it? I mean, it's pretty simple. I'd ask you to look at it this way. Which is more dependable, worry or God? I mean, can you imagine if the message today was, hey, put your faith in worry. That's the title of today's message. Let's all say it together. You know, who wants to hear a message about putting your faith in worry? We don't want to go down that road. Or what if our scripture says, trust in worry with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge worry and worry will make your path straight. It's ridiculous. You'd never intentionally place your faith in worry, and yet, is that not what so many of us inadvertently do each and every day when we drag tomorrow's concerns into today? Worry will never come through. We know that. We would say it's ridiculous. We know it doesn't work. Worry will never come through, so why worry? Why place your faith in worry? My prayer is that that can change today. Just some decisions can be made that will change that for you. And sometimes we make this so mystical and, and we try to, you know, maybe complicate it in a way to act like, no, it's never going to happen. Uh, you know, it's never going to change. You know, it's, it's always been what it is and it's always going to be what it's been. And, and, you know, hey, sometimes we just got to take some ownership and admit that what we do is what we choose. And if we decide that, you know, worry is destructive and it's not helping anything and that we want it to be different, we can decide I'm not going to worry. Now, that doesn't mean that if you walk out of here tomorrow and then you worry about something that you ought to just throw in the towel and quit. You say, man, I didn't want to do that. 
And so you, Lord, forgive me, I want to do better, I want to trust you more, and you get back on that horse and you ride again, and you keep doing that. And hopefully the gap between not trusting him, the gap from when you worry from one time to the next, it gets wider and wider and wider until that begins to be less and less and less a part of your life. See, the Apostle Paul, he showed up a few years after Jesus said these things, and he wrote a a letter to the church at Philippi that reiterates what Jesus said about worry, Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He basically said it like this, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, not the peace of people, not the peace of circumstances, not the peace of your job or your finances. The peace of God is what will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, ladies and gentlemen, is found in finding and knowing that God can be trusted. God knows your name. He knows where you are. He knows what you need. He cares about you. You can trust him. I don't know about you, but for me, that brings incredible peace, regardless of the circumstances. That's the kind of peace that transcends human understanding. See, so the bottom line is we can choose to worry or we can choose to trust. For some of us, if we're honest, we would have to say the decision to worry isn't even really a decision anymore. It has become a habit. It's been learned behavior. You saw it growing up, you've practiced it well, and that's the way you live. You're gonna have to be intentional, if that's you, about where you place your trust, because you will default to what you know. You'll go right back down to those well-etched ruts in your life. Worry can may be difficult to overcome, but the good news is it can be done. And so I'm going to give you four action steps that you can take hopefully today, this week, to help you in this uh, process. Action step number one, begin your day by declaring your trust in God. Begin your day by declaring your trust in God. Trust Him with whatever it is you wrote on that list of what you worry about. You're going to decide, I will intentionally place my trust in him, not in worry. Worry is meaningless. It has no value. It doesn't help. So I'm going to place my trust where it matters. I'm going to place my trust in God. Secondly, read Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. These are the words we've read today. You could reiterate those in your mind and, and relive some of these truths that Jesus has spoken. You could pick up a message application guide that's available at the Welcome Center or on our homepage. Uh, the message application just has questions that you can ask to apply these scriptures to your life about how you're going to live. Understanding that prayer or worry is like prayer in reverse. Worry has a way of making things bigger, but prayer has a way of making things smaller. Thirdly, you're going to get in the habit of relabeling all of your worries tomorrow. I'm going to relabel all of my worries, all that stuff tomorrow. I'm going to decide to sow and reap. I'm going to do what I can today, but I'm not going to bring tomorrow into today through worry. Whatever you worry about, whatever's on your list, you're going to just relabel it tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow because God knows what I need tomorrow and he can be trusted. And then when you begin to worry about tomorrow, number four, look for a way to participate in what God is doing today. This is how you seek first God and his kingdom. When you start to worry, stop right then and you pray for somebody else that's going through a difficult time. You get plugged into God's program. You decide not to worry about tomorrow, but you're going to participate in God's kingdom today in the here and now. I mean, wouldn't it be great if if worry could trigger a kingdom concern? I mean, if, if the devil thought that was the case with you and he was tempting you to worry and you decide you're going to quit worrying and you're going to seek first God's kingdom and you start praying for somebody that has a need, I believe the devil did get tired of calling on you to worry, don't you? I mean, why, why tempt you to worry when all you're going to do is start praying for the lost or getting plugged into what God's doing today in the way of ministry? See, God has promised if we will take care of his kingdom, seek first his kingdom, he will take care of ours. And we allow all these concerns about life, which are not even as big as our life, to be triggering concerns for others. That'll be a positive thing. And so Matthew 6, 25, Therefore I tell you, do not worry. Do not borrow from tomorrow. Learn to trust your heavenly Father. 
Do not worry. That's the message. I hope that you hear it. I pray God will help all of us to remember it, myself included, because we've got to overcome what Jesus has commanded so clearly in his word. I jotted down something this morning, and I'd never thought of it before, but I, I actually posted it this morning as, as I, it came to mind while I was reading and thinking and praying about this service. To tell Jesus, I trust you, and live like it is more meaningful than for him to hear me say, I love you, and then live like I don't trust him. I want to live like I trust him in my words and in my actions, and that shows my love. That, that is a demonstration of my love. So let's pray that God will help us. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes as we pray? <laughs> Lord, this is uh, certainly easier said than done. It's a message that has application for every person hearing it today, and, and it is a big deal. You spoke it. Do not worry. We want to learn to obey you. We want to learn to trust you more. We want to know you more. And as we know you more, I believe you're going to help us to trust you more. And so may our confidence in you grow as a result of what we've heard today. Jesus rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, there's no reason to worry. Father, as we uh, prepare to receive this morning's tithes and offerings, just another tangible way to seek first the kingdom of God, bringing the tithe into the storehouse, bringing our offerings in, we could say, well, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can afford. I've got some things to do. But we're seeking first. We're doing what you told us to do. We're trusting you in this tangible way. We're putting you first. We're growing bigger and bigger faith. And so I pray that your blessing would be on this offering, each one of us together as we seek to learn to trust you more each and every day that we live. And for what's accomplished, we will give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.